I again want to welcome you to inclusive SciComm second year. Again, I'm Kendall Moore. I'm a professor of journalism here at the University of Rhode Island, and I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker. Her talk is entitled, Tilting at Windmills, the Quixotic Quest to Report Environmental News in South America. Dr. Prado, Paula Prado is a professor of journalism and digital media and program coordinator for Latin American and Latino studies at Roger Williams University, which she founded. This university is in Bristol, Rhode Island, nearby. I met Paola recently as we were judges for the Metcalf Awards for Diversity in Journalism, and we quickly learned that we had a lot in common. We connected over two things, more than two things, but two specific things. We had both worked for the news agency Reuters, and we both had very strong connections to Latin America. She was born and grew up in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, where she spent much of her time in nature, exploring coral reefs and sailing with her father up and down the coast. She went to the beach nearly every day and enjoyed the friendship of farm animals and not so farm animals. Yeah, thanks. I'm too loud. She had a sloth. <laughs> she had an albino boxer named Sancho Panza. Sancho Panza, good name. And she had a penguin, a pinguino. And um, apparently, she helped save this penguin from drowning. So good on you, Paula. <laughs> so she comes to science communication via journalism. She was a pioneer, is a pioneer in online media. Um, Paula created content for the Latin American and U.S. Latino branch of Real Networks and led U.S. operations for the Latino community portal, portal El Sitio. Prado began her professional career at Reuters, as I mentioned before, where she produced news reports for broadcast worldwide. She went on to lead affiliate relations for the pan-regional news, cable news network CBS Telenoticias and later for the Weather Channel Latin America. Her research focuses on environmental journalism and on information and communication technologies for development and social change in Latin America. Um, Paula has authored journal articles, book chapters on topics related to environmental risk, news reporting, and digital inclusion in Latin America. She's the co-author of Environmental News in South America, Conflict, Crisis, and Contestation, which is uh, published by Palgrave. Um, she holds a PhD in communication from the University of Miami and a master's degree in Latin American studies. Again, something I share with her. Um, she has a BA in cinema studies from Denison University. She's a recipient of the Dr. Mark Gould Award for Commitment to Student Learning, and she was a 2019 Hassenfeld Faculty Fellow for Community Engagement, and she is fluent in English, French, Portuguese, Spanish. Today, she will share her thoughts on how the Latin American news media report environmental risk while using a critical lens to show how those most affected are left out of the dominant narratives. She writes, I care about the next generation of journalists who are there now working to get the story out, especially this story of catastrophic, cascading environmental collapse. So let's put our hands together and join me in welcoming Dr. Paula Prado. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm very pleased to join you today to talk about issues of social justice and ethics in science communication. I understand you've been having a wonderful time uh, in some profound discussions about this topic. Um, before I start, I want to thank you, Ken Kendall, wherever she went. Oh, there she is. <laughs> uh, Kendall Moore, who got me uh, here, and Dr. Sunshine Meneses, who, um, like me, shares some bonds with Brazil. And uh, also thank the Metcalf 
Institute and the University of Rhode Island for bringing me across the bay to uh, share some of what I have learned as I moved from the newsroom to the classroom and into research collaborations with some wonderful people from different disciplines. TV production still runs strong in my blood, even after I left the newsroom. So I brought some visuals and I just, because I teach also media law, I just need to make the disclaimer that the photos and videos you're about to see are mostly my own work and whenever uh, they are not mine, they are credited. Um, the satellite images you're gonna see are generated by Google Maps and here's the first one. So I'm going to invite you to journey with me into South America. This is here in the Latin American region where I have for the past decade researched how the news covers environmental risk. I launched this uh, program of study with a fellow cane, and I think there are a couple canes in the room from what I, I saw. Um, so uh, Juliet Pinto, who is now at Penn State University, has been my colleague uh, and co-author in a lot of the work we have done. And basically, our research has examined how news media reports the stories of the environmental conflict and, and risk that happens in this region. Um, our journey starts there, in, on the shores of the Uruguay River, between Argentina and Uruguay, um, where in Fray Bentos, con controversy and protests over the pollution generated by a major pulp mill led us to look at how local and national news tell the stories of conflict when local communities called out this industrial operation that spewed pollutants into the river that marks the border between the two countries, um, that's what got us launched when we started examining how the news of that story was being told. Uh, next, we uh, set off to Ecuador, where um, in the Amazonian area, you may have heard of the case where contamination of oil exploration of lakes and rivers brought about great harm to indigenous populations. The oil fields in the Lago Agrio region operated and eventually abandoned by Texaco and later acquired by Chevron in 2001, they became the subject of a protracted dispute after the oil giant dumped toxic wastewater and crude oil in open pits and rivers. That sparked an epidemic of cancer, birth defects, and other illnesses among the indigenous people who had never before suffered any of these ills. The legal battle started in 1993 over this contested space, settled only last year at The Hague, where the International Arbitration uh, Court addressed the genocidal disaster. And it was the subject of a 2009 documentary, Crude, the Real Price of Oil, which some of you may have seen. So also in the Amazon, <clears throat> we looked at Brazilian news report reporting about the construction of Belo Monte, uh, a mega dam that diverted the Xingu River, uh, deforested ancient rainforests, and attracted tens of thousands of migrant workers to an area which had one town where the largest population was basically 40,000. So 11 kilometers away, the building of this dam brought people uh, from all over Brazil into an area that before already could barely uh, sustain the population, the urban population and of course the crisis of quick urbanization in a place where there's no sanitation, for example, uh, was tremendous, not to mention the effects of diverting the Xingu River uh, as well. So because Brazil, uh, because uh, the dams in Brazil, in the Amazon jungle are uh, said to power the urban centers, um, we know 
that it's important to remind people who are not so familiar with what's happening that the ban these dams, the mega dams, are really there to power mines and mining complexes. And because of that, there is a link to the next topic, which is while we we had been looking at the dams and the mines in the Amazon, there was a tragedy that happened in Minas Gerais. In the, state, in the state of Minas Gerais, which is in the southeastern part of Brazil, and we started looking at that. You may have heard of the Tailings Dam collapse at uh, iron ore mines in the mountains, and those disasters basically drowned uh, many lives and repairing systems in toxic waves of mud. Um, I'll come back to this case in detail in a few minutes. But to give you an idea of the range of what we've been looking at, we uh, came uh, also to the Dominican Republic, where in a collaboration with historians and political economists and biologists, um, we started looking about the cycle of news coverage that happens or doesn't happen on the border re region between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And that is a history, a convoluted history, but it does also bear on this case because it's mostly a story of deforestation and strife, strife across a border. And all along throughout the past decade, we traveled back and forth in our uh, research to South Florida. And that's where we started our collaboration. And along with many other colleagues who look at news coverage that happens in Florida of sunny day flooding, king tides, and hurricanes, we started to study that coverage um, because Miami is a place that we, those of us who live there, fondly call the capital of Latin America, with some <laughs> irony, right? Um, and so we keep touching point there, touching base. Um, and it's interesting to think of that place, that tropical paradise, a city where only beachfront luxury condos rise faster than sea levels. So from Miami's uh, tropical sandy beaches, I'm going to take you to the arid desert of the Atacama in Chile to examine and look at how the press covers the environment, whether it be hurricanes or extraction or mining collapses. In each case, as we looked through and studied this, we found that transnational projects pose tremendous environmental risk that spiked crisis, conflict, and controversy. In every case outside of Florida, our research brought us to learn about extractivist operations that spilled contaminants into rivers, streams, and aquifers, and the communities whose livelihoods depended on these waters. In every instance, there were transnational ventures. So although I'm here as a Latin Americanist to tell you how the press communicates the environment in Latin America, the story I bring you is a global story, one in which all of us are involved, if not complicit. In the time I have today to share with you some overarching patterns that we have found, um, I'm going to basically go over a couple of cases briefly, and then I will outline some of the obstacles that the press faces as they set out to tell these stories. Lastly, I will get to those windmills. So since many people here are researchers, I just feel compelled to explain that the way we go about doing our work is a quantitative content analysis and uh, close uh, open-ended interviews with reporters, editors, and other stakeholders in the field. Um, and basically, the questions we're asking are questions about how does the news report these stories? Uh, how do the local and national dailies in Latin America uh, frame the concept of environmental risk? Uh, we ask, does that change over time? Who gets quoted? Who gets left out? 
Does that change over time? And overall, we're looking for narrative arts and seeing if they all compare. And we have found some uh, strong evidence that the story gets told often the same way. So why does that matter? Well, we know that research shows that the public learns about environmental risk mostly from the news media. So take a minute and think about the latest catastrophic environmental crisis you heard of. How did you learn about it? Likely through a news report or through the media, right? Maybe it came across your Twitter screen, right? So to quote agenda setting theory, the news media does not tell the public what to think, but it does tell the public what to think about. And a corollary to that theory might as well be that the stories that the news media fail to tell remain out of sight and out of mind. So I'm going to show you shots of, oops, there we go, of the Atacama Desert. If you are prone to motion sickness, you might want to now go and tweet about how this woman is going on and on about environmental risk here, um, because you're, this could make you dizzy, OK? So these drone images shot above the Atacama Desert in Chile show the salt flats and the otherwise arid terrain atop the Cordillera de los Andes on the Inca Trail. Glacial patches of snow and ice straddle the border with Argentina, protected by high mountain peaks that are sparsely inhabited. The remote mountains and pristine air preserved, preserve intact ice reserves and vast amounts of clear, pure water bound in a perennial cycle where snowfalls and bracing winter temperatures naturally replenish the spring melt. Dizzy yet? <laughs> in the villages of the Wasco Valley below, home to the sacred ancestral lands and burial grounds of the indigenous Diaguitas, the watershed irrigates farms and supplies households. In this case, it even fills the pool of a luxury hotel located in the vicinity. This green strip of oasis on the Andes, where the balanced water storage and release ecosystem shimmers in stark contrast to the arid Atacama, bears graffiti scrawled on walls to protest a 21st century gold rush. The graffiti reads in Spanish, water is worth more than gold. The Pascualama project, operated by Canada's Barrick Gold mining conglomerate, consists of a suspended open pit mine that extracts gold, silver, copper, and other minerals at an altitude of 4,500 meters above sea level. The mine sits on the border between Argentina and Chile. 25% of it is in Argentina, 75% in Chile and there is a mining agreement between the two countries that allows for this exploration. Part of it has recently changed hands, uh, changed into the hands of a venture with a Chinese uh, mining conglomerate. In 2013, a Chilean court halted the mining operations because of violations related to the monitoring of the glaciers and basic sanitation issues. The mine was ordered closed by the Chilean government in 2018. So, oops, went too far there. So the conflict over the extraction of the wealth found beneath the Andes basically mobilized protests, mobilized civil society, and stretched from the courts, local courts in Copiapó to the Chilean Supreme Court. Um, it went all the way to the United Nations Human Rights Commission. The legal dispute focused on water shortage had to do ultimately in the courts with the constitutional rights of indigenous peoples. As the legal conflict grew, National news reports excluded the stories of those indigenous people and the communities at the front lines of the impact. Even though the mineral belt 
where the mines sit, there it is, go by the name of El Indio, the Indian. The Indian was out of sight and out of mind in this story. A Chilean reporter I interviewed uh, painted the picture of the recurrent reporting dynamic that reinforces systemic social exclusion. He told me, quote, the view from the capital is that the impact happens far away or in places that are ignored because they are poor. Such is the historical burden imposed by an overwhelmingly centralized power. So because we were looking at these mines, I thought the next logical place to take you is my own country and the home state, the state where much of my family came from. This uh, portrays the city of Mariana, where basically a tailings dam mine, a uh, tailings dam that contained the dejects of the iron ore mine operated by Vali, came undone. Vali is a, comp a company that is started in Brazil. It's still headquartered there, but it now operates in about 30 countries. And news reports seldom mention that this dam, known as the Samarco Dam, the dam that broke, uh, was part of a joint venture between Vali and Canadian multinational BHP Billington. Their name seldom made the news. So this became identified as the Samarco Valley uh, disaster. And also, another element that didn't get a lot of press is that there are, in Brazil alone, 87 such upstream dams that are built with the same design and potentially could also fail. There are about 3,500 tailing dams uh, around the world, many of them operated by Vali. So in 2015, the collapse of this dam led to widespread contamination of Rio Doce, a name which means sweet, sweet river. And the Doce River Basin got completely covered in toxic sludge. The break left 19 people dead, hundreds homeless, and the toxic mix that ran down river and the contaminants eventually went all the way into the Atlantic and beyond. The immediate loss of life and destruction created long-term health, environmental, and economic crises. More than one million people depend on this river valley. And the tributaries provide all the drinking water and those were also contaminated. Crop irrigation, fishing, industrial manufacture, all were impacted. Water service was suspended for 40 municipalities and villages throughout were having to reconsider what they farmed, what they ate on those uh, contaminated soils. Tons of debris flowed downriver to the estuary in the coastal state of Espírito Santo. The damage extends beyond. It went beyond the Atlantic forest biome into the coastal mangroves and an estimated 200 kilometers to sea to touch upon the Abrolhos Reef. The Abrolhos are one of the most distinctive areas of biodiversity conservation in the Atlantic. So news reports about the concerns of the victims were few, notwithstanding the fact that people were left drinking bottled water. And many had to abandon their subsistence farming. Among the affected were the indigenous Krenak people, for whom the Dosi River was a source of sacred waters. So their spiritual practices, their culture, as well as their livelihoods were dismantled. Tribal leaders called for demarcation of the indigenous uh, lands, yet four years later, 
there's been really no reparation, and those responsible remain largely unaccountable. So when that happened, these were the headlines. This is o Global National Daily, largest in Brazil, part of a major media conglomerate, and the state, main state paper, Estado de Minas. And any Portuguese speakers in the crowd here? So good. <laughs> so the headlines read, tragedy repeated and another crime. Because in January of this year, a new tailings dam collapse became one of the worst mining disasters in the world. Again, we saw a muddy, toxic sludge wash over and engulf the village of Brumadinho. At last count, 237 people were killed, hundreds of homes destroyed, and the iron ore mining ways that clouded the Paraupeba River impacted urban, riverine, and indigenous communities. The headlines are kind of ironic because in a way that's not what we saw the news coverage continue to talk about. The impact to underground water sources, the fisheries, the fauna, the vegetation has been nothing short of catastrophic. These ecosystems are likely compromised over the long term, if not forever. And in both cases, the Mariana case and the Brumadinho case, the news cycle followed the same pattern. Immediately after the dam break, you get breaking news, episodic news, and they, those focus on the loss of life and on the rescue efforts. Very soon thereafter, though, the press starts reporting on the economic impact of the damage, not the people. Estado de Minas described the 15-meter-high toxic wave of mud that flooded 133, 153 homes as a mud tsunami, which left a stain on, quote unquote, the economy. As weeks passed, news reports framed recovery as largely economic, rather than as a matter of community resilience, risk, public health, or even remedy. Within days, the narrative arc moved on from the testimony of victims and recovery efforts. Absent in the press were any analysis or recommendations on how to address lax environmental standards or, or how to create new regulations. The lack of focus on environmental impacts would be surprising, given the risk, were it not for the prominent role of mining in the state of Minas Gerais, and the role of Vale, not only in the state as a major employer, but as the fifth largest political donor in Brazil. It is a primary uh, source of employment in the state. So you can see how the news quickly and easily got transfigured into the economic impact and away from the victims. Framing the dam collapse as a disaster rather than repeated corporate criminal negligence effectively removes any sense of accountability for the corporation. The fat fatalistic tone of the narrative throughout makes it clear that there is no real justice and that even the courts won't achieve anything truly meaningful. So, Further north in the Amazon, this is the area, this is the Shingo River, and you're looking down here at Belo Monte, the mega dam I spoke about, the fourth largest in the world. The pattern we see here is similar. So this dam didn't break, thankfully, because it's humongous, um, but the creation, the building of this impacted the indigenous, the dispossessed, in huge measures. They were nonetheless repeatedly excluded from news stories. Amazon indigenous and riverine populations at the front lines of deforestation get nothing more than short mentions in the press. I'm gonna play a short clip 
uh, Francisco Vaz. A partir da legislação brasileira e internacional, a gente começou um trabalho de intensa capacitação das pessoas, das lideranças, sobre os seus direitos. This gentleman basically brings together indigenous communities into the realization that they have rights. He grows an association that then stands out and brings indigenous communities in to learn that under the Brazilian Constitution and under the international rights legislation, there are human rights at stake and that the indigenous people have a right to their lands have a right to clean water. Todos os cantos. E hoje é, não existia nenhuma comunidade indígena em 97, quando o grupo. He says, for example, that in Brazil it is a crime for one to utter a racial slur against an indigenous person. In his words here, you cannot call an indigenous person dirty or lazy because that is a crime punishable, an offense punishable with jail time. And my lawyer friends in Brazil love to tell me that Brazil has a perfect legal code and a perfect constitution. Well, there's a gap, right, between that ideal world and the reality of what we see every day. Here, for example, below you see a picture of lumber cut in a sawmill next to a motorboat. This was taken, I took this on the Amazon River. You can imagine why that motorboat is there. It's not for leisure. That's the quick getaway for when the three or four officials responsible for checking that there is no illegal logging going on finally arrive on their very slow boat, right? This is how the perpetrators of the deforestation get away. So, Closer to home, we see similar absences in the press. In, on the border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic, where I took this picture, literally standing on the Dahabon border, we see young people of Haitian descent who are silenced in their stories even as new legal decrees like the one that recently passed in 2014 in the DR effectively makes these individuals stateless. Social vulnerability scholarship identifies how the challenges of life are a permanent disaster for people already oppressed by class, race, gender, sexuality, disability, and age. The forces of systemic oppression are the cause of that disaster. Yet the ongoing social conditions that produce daily risk, suffering, and trauma go mostly unreported. Issues of forced migration, geopolitics, genocide, land grab, police brutality, racial and gender discrimination do not quite make the news. The example of this photo, these are the people who must walk every day to get water, right? And specifically that one, that little boy, right? He goes out to fill the jugs with water, walk those back home, and I shot this picture where he's walking to fill the jugs and happened to pass a sign sponsored by Brugal. Brugal, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to experience it, delicious Dominican rum, the largest rum brand in the Dominican Republic. I find this perverse. Consider that three quarters of the people in the DR do not have ready access to clean water. That's almost three million people. And water shortages are in part related to the steady rate of deforestation on the island. Much of the population at the border still relies on wood burning stoves. The DR has launched reforestation programs, but this satellite image shows very clearly on the west side, that's Haiti where much of the wood has been burnt for charcoal. And where you see the line, 
That's the Libon River, which marks the border. So the trees you see are all on the Dominican side. Erica Schomberger reminds us that all environmental problems are social problems. The landscape in Haiti, and this is what it looks like, right there on that border. It bears the scars of a land mired in misery. The earth dried out, and the water that flows into the rivers, including the Libon River, are contaminated by raw human waste. So on our most recent visit, this is a picture of a funeral of someone who died of cholera. Life on the border is a series of precipitous calamities and disaster, which brings on more disaster. So, as I took students, this is part of the work I do, I take students to learn how to report abroad, and we went to the village of Tivoli, where there was cholera, where raw sewage runs on the street, which is, of course is a dirt road. And as I interviewed people with my students, all well-fed from the U.S., looking healthy, all of us carrying cameras, I couldn't help but question the ethics of even being there in that situation and knowing that my students and I were very likely to come out physically unscathed. And those people cannot come out, right? They are stuck in that reality. And it was <clears throat> one of the sources that we were interviewing who said, it's important that you are here now go tell the story. So back to the DR side of the border, where we were staying, among the second grove forests. This is the small village of Restauración on the border, and you can see where it says Industria Madeira there. Those are sawmills. All right. And this is what they sound like, day in, day out. National news media seldom shows up at the border. The distances are vast, and the roads are bad, and that limits the sustained news coverage. On the rare occasion, a local reporter finally makes it up to the mountain, usually to Dahabon, where the candy seller uh, girl was standing. Uh, the resulting news account is tied to official narratives. The sources interviewed are government officials, and the story that comes out of that rewards obedience to centralized power. It, basically, it reaffirms all the cultural bias. Non-elite sources are seldom taken into account so that the historically entrenched colonial pattern and colonial discourse, the one that reinforces the structural racism, continues to be told. But before we get too comfortable with the notion that this is all happening in Latin America, I'm going to come back to Miami. Right? Because that same pattern of social exclusion that thrives in Latin America thrives in the tropical haven of Miami and all of South Florida. Post-storm news reports of hurricane cleanup focus on the wealthy areas even as the post-storm debris is clogging roads in Overtown and Little Haiti, areas where immigrants and people of color make their homes. Residents directly impacted by the storm are removed from coverage, 
given no mediated agency or voice, and instead, the news shows politicians and local officials speaking about how they will rebuild, how there will be a recovery, and how it will all be normal again. News pegs that rely on those elite voices repeat this mantra of business as usual, rebuilding, new start. Those are the phrases that we find again and again in the post-storm coverage. The story reaffirms the economic imperative that calls for growth. The myth of manifest destiny is alive and well in South Florida, and I would argue throughout the world. So how does this happen and how do we get around it? This coral is being regrown on, off the shores of Punta Cana because of course the corals throughout the world are being bleached and dying and massive die-offs off the coast of the Dominican Republic are imperiling not only the fisheries and the entire ecosystems but also the tourism that draws uh, people from, say, New England in the winter to <laughs> Punta Cana, right? And that is a major source of revenue. So when I take students there, I take them to an environmental lab where a Cornell uh, uh, expert, an expert from Cornell, is basically reseeding coral along the water. And we actually go on a dive and we see the new coral taking hold. So what you see there is one of my students taking a picture of that new coral that is growing. But overall, whether in Latin America, whether in North America, the routines that are in place in newsrooms make it so that only that information which is readily available can be on the newspaper, on TV, on deadline. Right? So there is kind of a natural sequence of events where reporters go to the tried and true, go to that quick call, go to what they can get to quickly to make a deadline. As circulations and readerships decline across the globe, reporters and editors work with minimal resources in understaffed newsrooms, and budget and personnel constraints can mean less opportunity for correspondents to cover issues on the ground or in the field far from that newsroom. So episodic reporting, the breaking news, tends to guide the coverage. And when breaking news hits, travel plans get canceled and lengthy investigations grow code. So every single journalist and editor I interviewed over these years told me at some point the same story, which is, I was going to get to the Amazon to tell that story, but then the president announced a new economic plan, or then the government announced a new initiative. And my editor said, I had to stay here to cover that story. So the stories of those in the front lines get shunted aside. Now, there's another issue here, which is that newsrooms are not wired for comprehensive reporting of mega issues. They rely on standardized production processes, established routines, and what that means that is that what is not readily accessible with a phone call is silenced. There's another issue, and I've experienced it often firsthand. Structural deficits in Latin America make it very hard to report the news from the places on the front lines of the environmental crises. Getting into the Amazon takes time, it's expensive, and travel hurdles abound. Uh, this is a photo I took when, those are some of my students, we went to explore a soy farming monoculture 
They have popped up all around the Trans-Amazonic Highway. And so you go up, and it's actually a dirt highway for the most part, right? It was put there to make sure the soy could flow in part to the to Santarin, uh, which is an Amazonian port, uh, and that's where the soy then gets on the ships and ends up in Europe. But taking the students there uh, to see this, our bus broke down in our van. And basically, st spending a night on the side of a road in the Amazon can present a physical danger, right? So that is also a deterrent to the journalists and the reporters. And although practicing journalism in many places around the world can carry substantial risks for journalists, Latin America ranks high for threats against journalists. Freedom House cited Brazil, Colombia, Honduras, and Mexico as among the world's most dangerous place for journalists. All in all, journalists in the region face ample incentives not to cover the environment. Lack of specialized knowledge, lack of training is one part of the challenge, but also there are threats from a punitive legal environment. And we know of many stories where journalists who go on to investigate political or corporate corruption mysteriously disappear. Yet absent news coverage that weighs the environmental risk associated with the extractivist ventures I've been men talking about, how is the public to reach informed decisions about the compromises at stake? How can journalism, as well as other disciplines related to environmental communication, inform and educate the public? And inform them not only about what is happening, but the whys. I always tell my students the W that is most important is the Y W, right? Power relations and systemic factors compound environmental risk, and that's the story that's very hard to tell. This is a picture I took of deforestation out on the outskirts of Santarém, and it ended up being on the cover of our book. Global demand for energy, minerals, and other resources continue to target Latin America. South American political administrations have tied national economies to Neo's extractive development strategies. This has created vulnerabilities, not only to global commodity booms and busts and pricing cycles, but it also has created environmental and cultural degradation. Yet mining ventures remain profit-making industries. News accounts reported that BHP, Valley, and other mining stock outperformed giants like Apple, Facebook, and Google in 2018. Speaking of Google, Other than the fact that they generate tremendous wealth for a few, extractivist projects share something else in common. Their remote location in areas of difficult access not mapped by Google Street View. I shot this photo on the outskirts of Santarém, near an area that was being deforested so that housing developments could be built. When I say housing developments, these are basically improvised tin roof kind of homes. As you can see, there is no paved road, but Google Street View car was there, right at the edge of the jungle. As Latin American governments turned to China for new sources of capital, a commodity boom powered by new mega dams in these areas, have challenged the newsrooms in the region to actu accurately report the steady proliferation of these environmental risk factors because they are in far away remote areas. 
Naomi Klein, who has a new book out on fire. I suggest everybody take a look. She calls these areas sacrifice zones. This is a superimposed map of where Google Street View has mapped in Latin America. Can you identify the areas I talked about so far today? They map exactly the few areas where Google Street Views cannot yet reach. Out of sight, out of mind. So those of us in science communication community, I think, have a big challenge to come together and combine our efforts to help meanings be better understood. Audiences are often greatly in need of climate literacy, media literacy, and news professionals are starting to realize that when they create these stories, these narratives, they ought to be as transparent as possible about the means of production. There is something to be said for a holistic approach that brings us together to relay the complex power dynamics that barely surface in the news. And also to interrogate this glorification of economic growth. If I agree to be here today, it is because Kendall and Sunshine are very persuasive, but also because I believe educators, researchers, journalists, we all face a moral and ethical imperative to critique the narrative of economic gain and shed light on, shed light on the dynamics of denial. So by now you're saying, and where are the windmills, right? <laughs> here they are. So following this great tour of a devastated Latin America, I'm going to take you to a beautiful site. This summer I visited Spain in July to present the research about the Minas Gerais tailings dams, mines, news coverage uh, at a conference. And I got everywhere thanks to G GPS and Google, right? Including my hotel in Plaza de España. Um, I don't know who here has been to Madrid. But outside our hotel window is, was Plaza de España, which was undergoing renovation. And that is, on that square, the, there's this monumental statue of Cervantes. And that statue was all wrapped up, covered up, protected in a very lively visual metaphor of protection in an environment of total chaos. My husband and I then took a side trip to Sevilla, Seville, and Google Maps got us there too, right, and got us around. And what we saw there were that the sidewalks throughout the town is now, are, they are now being covered by canvas cloth. And here you see that process in action. And this is because in 100 plus degree heat, you cannot walk outside and do your daily biddings, go shopping, go to school, go to the doctor, unless you are very well hydrated, walk slowly, and walk in the shade. And of course, the old town does not have shade. Those trees were long gone. That's a whole other lecture about the Spanish Armada, right? But they, this also took us in this trip to the Alcazar Palace. Some of you may have been there, right? Beautiful Moorish structure. But in that palace, I was stunned to find myself during the tour inside the very room where Queen Isabella gave the orders to Magellan, Américo Vespucci, and Columbus to sail the oceans and go conquer the new world. 
That decree launched ships on a journey of discovery, genocide, and decimation. It also launched humanity on a journey toward the sixth mass extinction. I must admit that I found it very fitting when I, in August, the city of Seville declared a climate emergency. We are all impacted. So Cervantes and his Don Quixote have been on my mind because of the Spain trip, because of the statue of Cervantes. And some of you may not have read or may not remember Don Quixote, but basically Don Quixote de la Mancha by Cervantes is considered to be the first modern no novel. In it, Cervantes critiques chivalry and injustice. The story, which some of you probably know, tells of Don Quixote, who believes himself a knight who sets out to battle giants. Cervantes wrote, Quixote's faithful sidekick, Sancho Panza, my daughter, <laughs> attempts to roll back the curtains on his master's delusion. Your grace, what you see over there aren't giants, but windmills. And what seem to be arms are just sails. They go around in the wind and turn the millstone. Obviously, replied Don Quixote, you don't know much about adventure. <laughs> As the novel unfolds, we know that Quixote battles windmills. His damsel is actually a peasant girl. And he dies disillusioned in a world where nothing has changed. So the term quixotic has come to signify the impractical pursuit of ideals. To tilt at windmills is to chase romantically absurd adventures. With Quixote in mind, I set out to, when I got back in Rhodey, again using Google Maps, I found my way to the Block Island Ferry with a student to go record the offshore wind farm, the, which is now owned by Orsted, Dutch company, Danish company. Um, this is the first offshore facility to operate in the U.S. You may know that for the better part of a decade, various Quixotes tilted at these windmills. Those interest groups intent on keeping giants out of sight and out of mind but out of sight of luxury beaches and homes perched atop the waterfront, which of course are on eroding coastlines. We know that now. Maybe out of fear of offending the paradox challenged clean coal lobby. Less than three years ago, the five wind turbines you see here went into operation they rise 600 feet above sea level, and they generate 30 megawatts of power, which is enough to power all of the 440 homes in Block, on Block Island. And they're beautiful to see. I encourage you to go out there and take a look. It is breathtaking, uh, just the sheer magnitude of them. Slightly shorter were the cooling towers on the Totten River at Brayton Point. And I don't know how many of you know that those were imploded in April. I was there to get some of that video. That was once New England's largest coal plant. And it came crashing down thanks to lawsuits filed by conservation groups that showed hazardous plant emissions that violated the Clean Air Act. Fossil fuel industry and coal lobbyists have for decades used the news media to decry alternative and clean energy as impractical pursuits. Their consistent messaging accuses environmentalists and researchers of being romantically absurd. They would use the word quixotic if it were not that their messages are carefully scripted to appeal to primal instincts, to conjure the fear of scarcity, the fear of the dark, the fear that the blue light flicker of your cell phone will go dead. Out of the mouths of babes, through the megaphone of the news media, Greta Thunberg's voice rang out with indignation this week at the UN 
at what the grown-ups have wrought. Meanwhile, the grown-ups continue to brag about how, the battle giant, how they battle giants to fan the flames of economic growth. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth, she said. And I'm sure many of you in this room who heard that talk can hear her refrain. How dare you? Most of you here can tell a story similar to the one I just told you. You would probably excel at it, do it much better than I have, because of the richness of scientific detail and the gorgeous images of the natural world that many of you work with every day. Sunshine can tell you how much I hesitated to be here today. And I knew I'd be among so many brilliant minds, and I was unsure that I could tell the story as well as you could. You understand in ways better than I, and certainly better than I can express, how rapidly vast ecosystems are vanishing out of sight and out of mind. So when I agreed to step up today, I did so powered by the romantically absurd notion that I might give voice to the voiceless. I did so because I could then extend an invitation to each and every one of you to go full Greta <laughs> at every opportunity, in every conversation, whether you feel comfortable about it or not. Grab the spotlight, pick up the microphone, step in front of the camera, educate, inform, speak up. Tell the story on behalf of those who are out of sight and out of mind. Tell their story. Thank you. So I'm, I'm willing to bet you will all agree with me that, in fact, uh, Paula did a really phenomenal job of telling this story. So thank you again. I just want to note quickly that um, the so the poster session is supposed to start in 10 minutes. Um, we're running a little bit behind. So those of you who want to go over and make sure that your posters are set up, please go ahead and do that. Everything should be all set. but. I understand the anxious, the anxiety there, so please feel free. And, and then for those of you who would like to stay a few minutes, we'll, we'll take maybe 10 minutes worth of questions here. I ask that when you have a question, that you keep it a question and not a comment, and that it be very concise so that we can get as much conversation going here as possible. Alberto's first. That's an amazing presentation. I, I'd appreciate since, um, many of us are not from Brazil, some context to understand the erasure that's happening, and maybe there are parallels in the U.S., but is there freedom of the press, one, and two, is there any direct connections between the media and either corporations or the state in terms of the suppression of certain stories? In the same way, oops. <laughs> in the same way, it's my natural teacher tendency. I want to go to the person who I'm speaking to, but... Um, in the same way that there is everywhere in the globe, right? This is uh, that dirty truth that, again, there are economic interests. Newspapers sell advertising. Television sells advertising. Um, and as I explained, there's a tendency to have uh, ready access to political and government sources and corporate sources. So I think that that is kind of a simple way to put the question, because I think um, you just look at what happened in the U.S. media over the past four years, right? And you can tell that there are many influences at stake in any country. So Brazil has one of the world's, well, uh, at one point, 
debatably the fifth largest economy in the world. So it's a very sophisticated media environment. It was one of the first uh, countries in South America to have comprehensive broadcasting system. Um, so still, you know, newsrooms have to be resourced. They have to be staffed, right? And so the political intricacy, the political economy of news media coverage impacts coverage everywhere. As I told you uh, here, I wanted to make sure this didn't become a lecture about, oh, in Latin America, they're so messed up, right? Because I can tell you the same stories. And much to my surprise, because having grown in Brazil until the age of 18 when I came to college, I had this fantasy that in the US, I'd be safe from the military regime and from totalitarian dictators, right? And so here I came, and I'm a US citizen by choice. Imagine my horror, right? <laughs> And in doing so, I also studied newsrooms in Sweden, where basically you see some of the same, same dynamics in place. So I would like to kind of push back on that question to say, you know, not only here, right? Not only here, elsewhere too. Another question? Uh, hello. Uh, how do we infuse these Sorry, can same... You lift your, raise your hand. I Oh, okay. okay. How do we infuse the same preoccupation in our own communities? I'm from Peru. I'm very much aware of all these problems in Latin America. And yet we as migrants, we think we can be here to modernize. We want to have cars, buildings. We want to eat more meats. So there are a lot of things that we practice that are harmful to our own environment. And also we send sometimes food there when these countries sometimes are rich in, the, in all these environmental good food. So how do, how do we as scientists you know, infuse this in our minority communities when they have like TV with telenovelas and rather than issues and, you know, the, the issues that we are confronting. Mm -hmm. I think it's an excellent question because it's the paradox we live it with, right? So no doubt the actions that each of us take, either in our own lives to reduce our carbon footprint or as we teach uh, as educators or we, as we speak to the community, it's important that we encourage right, uh, people to consume less. And at the same time, the communities in the global south, low status communities even in the US, uh, they are not even consuming enough to stay healthy at this, some of them, right? So there are people for whom the low consumption uh, is really not an option because they are poor, right? So some things really need to come into their lives. So this low consumption uh, mantra that is going around in, in, the, uh, in, in the global north tends to speak to those of us who are in a situation of tremendous privilege. Um, so it's, it's a hard question to answer because it's not that I want to minimize the particular impact that each person can make. But again, I push back because the questions that we need to talk about, in my opinion, and get everybody talking about are the larger structural deficits that have been wrought into place within a colonialist impacted society, be it in Peru, which I know relatively well, or be it in New York City. It's the greater political economy. It is the capitalist ethos that is at stake. And that's what we need to grapple with, whether it be in our community or in our larger jobs in the world. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. I uh, live in New York City in this past week during Climate Week, I was able to attend several events, one of which I heard the Minister of Norway, the Minister of Gabon, the Minister of Guyana, the Minister of Costa Rica, and, and a, um, a representative from the Amazon. What I didn't know is the extent to which Norway is investing in these places 
because as the Minister of Gabon made clear, uh, there are very few places that are intact, uh, environmentally um, somewhat sound places left on the globe and unless we protect them. So they were appealing to the business sector uh, to, you know, change their thinking and invest and support these um, places that are uh, incredibly important to the total well-being of, being of the earth. So the the woman from um, Amazon, yes, the woman from the Amazon suggested that rather than money go through governments, it needed to go directly to the indigenous populations. And I'm wondering, I mean, it seems daunting, but I'd like you to maybe comment on if you've heard other people um, from indigenous places say something like that, and how could we ever create another infrastructure for the monies or resources to get to the places it needs to go? It's interesting that you mentioned Norway, because if, if memory serves, and again, this was 10 years ago, uh, the case of the pulp mill that I mentioned at the beginning on the border between Uruguay and Argentina, that is uh, partly owned. That venture is a Norwegian company uh, venture. Um, so, so that's the story, right? So there are entanglements at all levels, and that's why I said provocatively that we are all complicit, right? We are consuming these minerals. We are living in great privilege here in air conditioning, even though it's nice outside, right? So all of us are part of this uh, challenge. But to, this, to, the cha to the challenge of uh, financing or funding the indigenous communities, um, there have been efforts at that that have been successful. I'd love to show the pictures of um, there's an indigenous tribe in Brazil that has very little contact with uh, Western people, and they uh, basically got cameras and uh, satellite phones and I don't know what else so that they could get out the images whenever there is a group of uh, people coming in to cut down uh, the forest, right? So there are ways in which empowering those communities with the tools of the uh, of, of the empire can uh, be useful, right? And yet in Belo Monte, for example, one of the criticism that the government volleyed against the indigenous communities who were complaining that their lands are being taken away and deforested for this mega dam that goes to power the Chinese uh, mine, um, one of the critiques was, well, they got uh, payments and reparations and they went and spent that money buying a car or, you know, they spent all the money we gave them. So, you know, there's a discourse there that is really hard to make clear, right? Who am I to say that somebody living on that village in Tiroli does not have the right to have a cell phone or a car? Right? Why can't they be listening to bad pop music if they want to, right? I mean, who am I to say that? Uh, and yet those people, especially in the Amazon, the remaining indigenous people, are the people are, who are at the forefronts and the, for, uh, the front lines of protecting. Uh, that uh, that area, right? I had I had a uh, picture of a family I interviewed, who are indigenous, and they basically live in a preserve where their job is to uh, plant, right? And they're planting trees. They're reforesting an area that was already uh, decimated. Uh, many live there in extractive, uh, uh, with extractive trades, right, that uh, are sustainable. And I have many, many examples of that. And, of course, we have a former presidential candidate, Marina Silva, in Brazil, who I, I have the privilege of interviewing. And she speaks directly of that because she comes from a family of uh, seringueiros, right? So they extract uh, from the trees... Uh, the latex, and then, you know, the tree goes on living. So there are ways to make the forest sustainable. And so, yes, it's important to fund those communities directly. And yet we see what's happening now, right? Those forest fires that you probably heard about in the Amazon, those are about a land grab, right? So uh, if you, you can't really 
fight back against rifles and fire with, you know, a little plant that you need to grow from seed. Hi, over here. So you mentioned in your talk how Latin America was one of the most dangerous places to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. It is also one of the most dangerous places to be an environmental activist mm -hmm. with a lot of murders. And I was wondering if you could speak to how those murders are reported in the media or not reported on. They're not reported on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. Time for one more question. Uh, not, <laughs> not only that, uh, but I mean, of course, you know, there's the breaking news. You know, environmental activists killed, journalists killed, right? And, and the person that I travel to and take uh, students to the Amazon with is, specializes in the in land grab and the plight of indigenous communities. And he, several of his friends have been killed, right? Who are trying to fight against and speak up against uh, the decimation of the rainforest. Um, but again, it's breaking news. Nobody's talking about the larger systemic structures that are creating these systems of oppression and creating this chaos, right? And that's the conversation we really need to have, I think. Okay. Last question, I'll be fast. Um, thank you for your talk. I want more of you in journalism, and I want more spaces for people like you in journalism. Um, but new media, and in particular the ad structure and for-profit models, are, are sinking that style of journalism right now, and it leaves it to nonprofits to make that argument, but then cool organizations like Pacific Standard go under, even with that model. How are we going to get more deep environmental reporting to happen? If we could go to the moon <laughs> with the computing power that is lesser than what's on my cell phone now, we can find a solution to what is simply a business problem. The solutions that are difficult to find are the ones that have to do with how we treat each other and how we see ourselves within the planet. Those are hard to get to. Financing a newsroom, easy easy in the scale of what we're confronted with now.